Hello, Bob Scholar here. Thank you for joining me today. This is a tutorial on Chopin's very famous E flat major nocturne, opus 9, number 2. Probably the most famous piece ever written for the piano, or maybe up there in the top three. Before we continue, I would like to thank each and every viewer and subscriber and friend of mine on YouTube for all the support you've given me and all the views that you provide my videos with. Um, it really means a lot to me, and I wouldn't do this if it weren't for you, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, Chopin's Nocturne is a very important piece historically. Uh, it was written when Chopin was uh, still young. It was early in his career, and he was exploring the possibilities of the piano, and he really, um, really composed a gem. Uh, it's no wonder why this piece is so popular. It's a gorgeous, beautiful piece. And um, I hope to do it justice with this tutorial, and I hope that I can help you in your uh, practicing and your approach to the piece. I make no apologies for the length of this tutorial, which is over an hour long. It's my longest tutorial yet. It's about 66 minutes. So I suggest that uh, you view it. Um, by the way, this is Charlie. I, I suggest that you view uh, this tutorial in, in sections, since it's so long. I divide it into five sections. The first section is the right hand um, alone, with no pedal. The second section is the right hand alone, no pedal, with metronome. I explain how to use a metronome on that section. The third section is on the left hand with no pedal. And the fourth section is on both hands together with no pedal. And then finally, uh, we put the pedal to everything in the fifth section, uh, hands together with pedal. The reason why I avoid pedal so much in the beginning stages is that we need to learn to control our fingers and our technique first. And the pedal serves as um, almost like, you know, if you have a cake uh, and you have a frosting on the cake, the, the preparation is the cake, the, you know, the hard part, the hard preparation is, is uh, the foundation. And then the pedal that we start to add after that is really the easy part. So it's, it's really hard to mask uh, bad technique with pedal, you know, to hide your mistakes or hide your insecurities with pedal. That's why I really highly advocate practicing with no pedal as much as possible and then adding pedal later. So you may want to use this tutorial as a model for um, the other pieces that you're working on as well. I follow this approach in pretty much everything I learn. I, I do about 70% of my practice with no pedal uh, in the initial stages. So let's get going on Chopin's Nocturne. I hope you enjoy this tutorial and I hope you can refer back to it at your leisure. Thank you. Hello, welcome. In this first segment of the tutorial on Chopin's Nocturne, we're going to work on the right hand alone. And I've divided this into two subsections. The first section I will play and explain as I'm going along, usually by phrase by phrase. And then I will play uh, the complete composition through from beginning to end with just the right hand. Remember that we're working with no pedal right now. So let's get working here. And I'd like to choose a slow tempo that we can work with that's not too fast. This is a little slower than what you usually hear this piece played at. 96 for eighth note. So let's Let's start here with the right hand. Okay, let's take this first three measure phrase. As you may have noticed, I was 
strictly in time until I got to the last cadence. And I slowed down a little there. I think it's a good idea to uh, to give a little leeway there on, on the cadences, a little bit of uh, retard on those there, but in general uh, to have a steady kind of beat going. Also notice that the B flat is softer than the G. And the F is louder than the E flat. So these decisions can usually be made uh, if you sing the composition. I used to like to um, suggest to students to always sing things, especially with things that are very cantabile, uh, like this uh, Chopin Nocturne here. Bring the G out. Da, 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 da. Bring the F out and then taper the E flat off. Let's go on. You want to really bring the C out up here. Also, don't be so concerned with... Don't try to play the turn too fast. Try to play it uh, a little bit more lyrically. That's loud and softer. Loud. Soft, loud, a little bit louder. And then the C is a little bit softer. So the, what we're doing here is we're crafting, we're crafting this, this uh, three measure phrase, not so much by thinking of the whole phrase, but rather by crafting note by note, what note, how do the notes relate to each other? So now let's move on to the second phrase, which is pretty much an embellishment of the first. Very, very lush and improvisatory sounding here, but it's under a very strict left hand bass, as we'll get to when we go over the left hand. Let's go over some things here. Make sure that the E flat there is brought out. Chopin has a, um, a uh, accent mark there. It may be Paderewski's, I'm not sure. This is, by the way, I am using Paderewski's edition of the Nocturnes. So some of these marks might be his, some Chopin's. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, research it. Uh, but we will assume that Chopin wrote that accent there. A little bit more there. Ooh, this is very special here. I don't hear this a lot in performances. Some, some, the, the best performances you'll hear this, but we have slurs with accents over this. So make sure you don't fall into the trap of playing very even. You really don't want a totally even sound. You want it to crescendo at the same time as you're giving it slurs. And then you're going to the B flat there, the top note. The trill. Some performers play all trills as fast as they possibly can. I really try to uh, avoid that, especially in lyrical music like this. It's really not necessary to play the trill as fast as you can. So I would suggest just a moderate trill. I use 3-2 on the trill. You can 
really bring out those top notes. Maybe a little bit of tapering off there at the end and slowing down. Retardando. Let's go on. Make sure you bring the F out more than the C. Chopin marks poco retardando here. So this is in time here. And then I would retard here. And then in tempo here. You may notice I do finger substitutions. I play five, I play four, switch to five, three, and then switch to five. And then three, two. This section is interesting here, measure 12. It has Chopin marks, staccato marks on the chords. And eventually when we use pedal with those, that will be what we call portato. So it's not staccato, it's not legato, it's something in between those with a very nice color effect with the pedal. So here is staccato. Actually, this is too short. Make sure you don't play it too staccato. too pointed. Make sure it's make sure it's long enough and when we will be stretching it out there with the Rowland Tondo. And uh, with when I discuss it, the pedal, we'll go over what it sounds like there. Let's go on. This arpeggio figure here, or broken chord figure, I would hold every note down, even though it says not to. Avoid that, but try to do that instead. Even with pedal, it creates a different color. And I would play, I know that some, I would be in disagreement with some people, but I like to play those three notes before the beat. So, I don't like that, I like like it before the beat. I know that might not be academically correct, but that's what I prefer. So let's go on. Remember your slurs, slurs again there. something very interesting and different. We have... And Chopin marks a... either Chopin or Paderewski mark a accent on the C flat. Very interesting. Excellent harmony there. When you play this, don't be so concerned with playing it in time. In fact, it's impossible to play it in time. Uh, you won't be able to, so feel free to stretch that out. It doesn't need to be as fast as possible, even though they're 30 second notes. Don't feel like it has to be. Don't, don't feel like it's a race. I would play. Something like that. Something that, that sounds a little freer and more improvisatory. Let's go on. Now we have four notes instead of three. So four. We're going to slow down a little bit there. And forte. Staccato and remember not too fast. We're just practicing the right hand. You want to hear every date detail. Now we have something. 
something different here. There's lots of possibilities for fingering here. I haven't really figured out what I want. I usually use a different fingering each time, but uh, the sound should be very improvisatory. Don't don't rush it like the the one the one before it. Something like that, maybe. Very free sounding. Let's go on. Even softer here. This turn. Try to avoid a fast turn. Uh, a lot of less experienced students assume that all ornaments have to be very fast. This is actually a very, uh, imp uh, a very vocal sounding ornament. So pretend like you're singing it. Da, 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 da. Very soft here. Bring out the top G. Slurs are very important. Loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft. And we'll be we'll be broadening that out with retardando. Let's go on. Yeah. Uh, this part, these two measures are the ones I just played are usually uh, a little bit faster. It says con forza. This is what uh, Chopin marks. So this, this implies more power, more force. Moving on. Hey, Charlie. This is Charlie, by the way. Nice cat. He, this is his favorite place to sleep. So let's go on. Off this. Remember, there's no pedal, it sounds dry right now. And now we have three, two, four, one, three, two, four, one. And there are a total of 12. And then on the 13th one, it starts going down. And so I like to count. <laughs> he almost fell. I like to count by every eighth, every, every eight notes. So one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, and then on the seventh one, then you start going down by there. I messed up at the end because I was talking, but it's a And it sounds really nice with pedal. Once we add pedal and we have the bass notes in the pedal, it's, a, it's an excellent effect for the piano. Chopin really knew how to write for the piano here. I have a way to cheat, and I have a really fun way to play this. Get 3-2 and 3-2 like this. So we're going to right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. a lot easier. I know it's cheating, but I like to play it that way. It, it actually allows for actually a better sound. You can get more control, I think, on it that way. So experiment. You can do it the hard way. Or the easy way. Your choice. You got to cheat to win. That's what they say. Okay, let's go on to the last two measures. The last two measures are very important. A lot of performers just take them for granted, but I strongly believe the last two measures really are actually the, mo the most important measures of the whole nocturne. 
The reason is, this is the last thing the listener hears, and if they're too fast, it ruins the serenity and the calm that's established throughout the whole piece. So let's say we're going to take our opening tempo. Let's say if we take a tempo like two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then the last two measures are this. But what I hear a lot in many performances is the performer will have a nice tempo in the beginning. Two, three, one. Very nice tempo. And then when they get to the end, they play like that, which really psychologically uh, breaks up actually actually ruins it because we don't have that unity the unity that that Chopin so ingeniously wrote in to the music here the last two measures so make sure that you're very conscious of the tempo you choose for the last two measures make sure it's 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 exactly the tempo you choose in the very beginning and the tempo that the the main tempo that you have throughout the piece I happen to prefer a slower tempo here, uh, as I mentioned later. Uh, I, I really love uh, Rubenstein's recording, for instance. I may I may have been influenced by that, so uh, this is this is the reason for my slower tempo in this nocturne. <clears throat> okay, now let's um, let's just uh, play through this. Now I won't talk very much, and I'll just play through the right hand at a nice um, slow kind of slow speed, like 96. Listen to every detail, every nuance. Some notes are louder, some notes are softer. go a little bit faster in this part. Also the, the previously. Oh, don't 
stand on it. Listen to every note when you practice. Starts growing here. Original tempo. So there we have the right hand by itself. I talked through it and then I played it. Tried, I tried very hard to, to bring out nuances. I hope you can hear those. And I hope when you work on it, that you will do the same thing. Uh, what you should not do, and what you should never do in learning any music, is just learn notes. So I would really um, try to avoid just learning notes. If, if it starts to sound every note is exactly the same, try to get away from that and try, you might want to try singing it. And uh, you want to play how a good singer would sing it. So uh, in the next segment, uh, we are going to take the right hand again with no pedal, and we're going to put metronome with it. And I will explain uh, my techniques in how to decide where to have strict tempos and where to bend tempos. And I'll show you my, my way of practicing it with a metronome. So stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, now in this segment, uh, I'm going to run through the nocturne using a metronome uh, to show you some techniques you can use uh, when you use metronome in your practice. Once again, I'll take 96, as we were working on before. And let's go on just right hand, no pedal. slow down a little bit <laughs> can slow down a little bit here that doesn't need to be strictly in time and go on Once again, you can slow down there. It's very interesting is you should get, get or try to get used to playing with a metronome, but get used to being able to slow down or speed up with a metronome on. That's what I like to do. So just because you have a metronome going doesn't mean you have to play everything strictly in time. Play it in time when you need to and then when you want to retardando, like it ends of phrases, like in this nocturne, keep the metronome running, but slow down. Very interesting feeling. Okay, so let's go on.
ritardando. So that won't be in time. Now it goes back into time. Keeping time there. Now we're in time. Chopin writes Popo Rubato, so it won't be exactly in time here. Stretch the time there. Retardando. So there are there are certain points in, in this in this phrase here where you want to be in time, certain points where you want to slow down a little bit. Once again, let's do this phrase. I would play it in time here. Now here you need to stretch it. Here in time. And there, retardando. And here, we're going to speed up, so here you don't need to listen to the metronome anymore. So forth and so on. So, what I would, oh, let's do the last, the ending. So after this, draw all that stuff, and you're coming down, you're coming down, you're coming down, now. Remember, like I said in the last segment, that you want to make sure that the last two measures are the equivalent tempo of your original tempo you set in the beginning. So make sure that, that you're not too fast there at the end, okay? So practicing with a metronome is important. In fact, Chopin is said to have given his students uh, the metronome to practice with, but just because you practice with a metronome doesn't mean everything has to be perfectly in time, especially in a nocturne like this where you can stretch things out, you have a lot of retardandos, you have sections or little phrases where you'll have a more improvisatory sounding things where you're stretching the time. Make, you want to have that freedom. So when you're practicing with a metronome, 
it doesn't mean you can't have freedom. But uh, I would suggest trying to find the places where you do want to be in time. Uh, you, it, it, needs, it, it needs to have freedom. This uh, Music like this needs freedom, but at the same time it needs to have um, a sense of unity. And that unity comes from a steady beat and keeping that beat uh, because it provides listeners something to fall back on. Um, I would suggest probably my favorite uh, performer of Chopin is Rubinstein, Arthur Rubinstein. I would suggest uh, to get an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, try listening to some of Rubinstein's recordings like this Nocturne and other pieces. You will find quite surprisingly that Rubinstein actually keeps a, a stricter beat than most other performers. He, he does have slight uh, gives and takes, he has slight rubatos, he, he, he does use rubato tastefully, but at the same time he, he keeps a very strict beat, in fact more so than most other performers. And I think that uh, you know, Ru everyone loves Rubenstein's playing. And I have a feeling that uh, part of that has to do with the way that he was able to control his rubatos. Uh, for instance, having a metronome, playing with a, a steady beat, but at the same time knowing when to let up. <clears throat> so, you know, like at the end of the first phrase, And that's not strictly in time, but the beginning that's strictly in time. So it's a balancing act from uh, balancing what uh, what you think where the stretching should be and where the strictness should be, but it should have a sense of strictness. So I, I highly suggest practicing with a metronome here and knowing when to keep it in time and when knowing not to keep it in time. Thank you. Hello, in this segment we're going to focus on the left hand and I'm going to play through the left hand with no pedal and explain some things as I'm going along. So let's get going here. Once again, 96, a little bit slower than what most people play it at. This will be our speed to work with. And remember, no pedal. So let's go left hand. Now, just to, um, just to clarify things here, Chopin has slurs here, so so this means that you want to keep your fifth finger down on G as you're releasing E flat here in order to play the next chord. And this is the general rule for most of the left hand throughout this piece. So I, I won't have to explain that, but uh, as we, as we go further into the piece, but I just want to point that out. It's very important. Even with pedal, it creates a different sound. When you, you give a slight emphasis to... In other words, the, the second beat, the second eighth note of each dotted quarter note beat will be slightly more than the third. So it's... loud soft. So it's bass note loud soft. Bass note loud soft. keeping time. 
stretch it out a little bit. And then back into time here. that out. Let's go on. Not too fast. Back in time. Really delicate with the left hand. Not too loud. <coughs> it's almost like you're walking on eggshells. Very delicate. Now here we're going to stretch it out a little bit. That's when the right hand has all its ornamentation and now we go back into time here. cadenza, and then we have our final two measures. Remember, final two measures. 
others you want the same speed so if your if your speed for the piece is then the last two measures will be Now, it's interesting that Chopin has uh, stems going up on this B-flat, and so one option is you might want to bring that out. It's, it, it's a different color. Uh, actually, it's, it's a really nice sound, actually, if you bring that B-flat out. Not too much. It's all within the all within the realm of pianissimo, so it's very soft, but you might want to bring that out a little bit. It, it, it creates a different color. So, let me just test to see how, yeah, we were pretty close to 96. In fact, we may have been a little bit slow, just for practice. So, make sure that when you play your left hand, it's very, very delicate. You, it's almost like walking on eggshells. You're, you're, it's, everything is very delicate, but you don't want your shoulder to be up. You don't want tension. And you want to be relaxed, but at the same time, you, you need to keep somewhat of a strict beat. But like we went through in the metronome section, you're going to have sections where, where you're going to stretch it out. In the next segment, we will put both hands together with no pedal. See you then. Hello. In this segment, we're going to put hands together in Chopin's Nocturne, but still with no pedal. Uh, you might be wondering by now, when are we going to get to pedal? You know, this really needs pedal. It, it sounds better with pedal. But, you know, I, I really strongly believe that in order to uh, work up a piece to its full potential, that one needs to practice as much as possible first with no pedal and then add pedal. The tendency in using pedal in the beginning for most people and most, most students is there's a tendency to use pedal as a crutch and so you know to make, you make it to hide your your insecurities to hide to hide your your mistakes and in order to get around that uh, to really expose yourself to your own weaknesses i highly suggest to practice with no pedal at all until you have it down technically at a level to where uh, you don't have to struggle anymore with your hands and your fingers and your fingering and all that technical uh, stuff. Arthur Rubinstein, uh, one of my, probably my favorite Chopin uh, performer, said that the, the pedal is the soul of the piano. I highly agree with that. The pedal is, is uh, an often neglected aspect of piano playing, not very well understood, but Here's the, the, um, the paradox of this is in order to be able to pedal well, to learn pedaling well, one must first learn with no pedal. So that's why this, this segment will be with no pedal, hands together, and the next segment will finally put pedal with it once we have everything clear. So let's get going. and. Play with no pedal hands together. I'm taking our tempo that we had at 96. It's a nice slow speed that we can work with. And let's go here. Remember, no pedal at all. It's going to, going to sound dry, but um, it will expose everything to our ears that we need to work on.
strive for a singing tone, singing tone in your right hand. sounds very dry, no pedal, but that will all be caught in the pedal. This whole uh, last section here will all have pedal in it. We're going to do our thing here, or if you want to do it the easy way. And now make sure we're back at our original speed here. slow down so much at the end because it's already a slow speed if you return back to your original tempo. I happen to really love uh, Rubenstein's performance of this. It's probably my, my favorite one. He plays it slower than most other performers, which um, I actually like. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've gone back and forth between slightly faster speeds, slightly slower speeds, and I, something brings me back, something always brings me back to the slightly slower speed as, as uh, Rubenstein plays it. So um, you might want to listen to that, study his recording, and study the way that 
Rubenstein keeps a very strict bee, but at the same time he allows certain flexibility within that strict bee. So this is the segment on uh, hands together, no pedal. You want to make it sound as good as you possibly can with no pedal hands together, have total control. Once you have that, then when you add pedal, it's so much easier. The, the next step will be very easy now because all you have to do is just add pedal, which is really just like frosting on the cake. It's actually the easiest part to do once you've tackled the hard part. So it's been hard, it's been difficult up to this point. Now it's going to get easy and it's going to start sounding just really beautiful now that we can start adding pedal. So stay tuned and uh, we'll get to the pedal. Thank you. Hello, welcome back. Uh, we are going to uh, finally put the pedal uh, to Chopin's Nocturne in this uh, final segment. Up until this point, we've, uh, we've worked on the right hand with no pedal, the right hand with a metronome. I explained how to keep a steady beat, but at the same time have flexibility. And then we focused on the left hand with no pedal, uh, keeping a nice steady beat uh, and the, the little subtle slurs and accents Chopin has in the left hand. We put then the hands together, right and left hand, no pedal. Now finally we can enjoy the fruits of our labor. We've gotten through all the hard part. We've got the technique down. We have the fingering. We have the control. Everything is there. Now we're going to add pedal. The first thing I'd like to do before we go through it is just to uh, give you a little exercise you might want to do. First of all, the pedal uh, with the pedal, you want to keep your heel on the floor, like my, my hand is your foot, the heel on the floor, and just slight pedals, don't, don't uh, make a lot of sound with the pedaling, it doesn't have to be very much, just slight uh, going down and up, just slightly with the uh, ball of your foot. And that was my cat, Charlie, trying to scratch my piano bench. Um, anyway. So we're just going to deal with a damper pedal or the right pedal right now. So let me give you a little exercise. And the exercise will be, we're going to take one, two, three, just the pinky of your left hand. We're going to play the bass note with the pinky of your left hand. Now we're going to add pedal. One, two, three, one. go down with the pedal just in time to where you catch the next note that you're playing with your finger. Okay? I would suggest actually doing this throughout the whole piece. Practice it like this. legato with the right hand, you're playing non-legato with the left hand. That's what I cover in my hand independence tutorial, so you might want to look at that uh, if you haven't already. So now let's go through the whole piece. We're going to return to our tempo of 96. Now, 
action. I like a slightly faster speed, so you might want to speed it up a little. Slow it down there. Back in speed, and this is forte. That means playing staccato or detached while using pedal at the same time. So here's with no pedal, and here's with pedal on every chord. Pedal, 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 pedal. Back to our original speed. for a page turn. There's some real great possibilities for color effects there. One thing is you don't need to play in time. In fact, it's impossible to play in time there. So don't be concerned about keeping the beat. Uh, pedaling is important here though. Here's a pedal. Change the pedal. And after the C flat, which is accented, I like to change pedal here, but I'm still holding down the notes in my left hand. So I have the fullness. You can experiment a little with that and see, see what, what you can come up with. A little bit, I like a tiny bit faster here. And a little bit letting up there in speed. Impossible to play that in time. Do what you can there. Even softer here. Pedal. Don't change the pedal here. Keep it down. Pedal. These two measures are the softest measures of the whole piece. Very, very softest, so be very delicate if you can. You can retardando there. A little bit louder here. It's growing, it's growing. to do it this way because it's easier. I like to cheat. And then now change. Pianissimo. Very light and delicate. Not too fast. One, two, three. You're back in your original speed here. So if we have Have 
the same speed. Now I'll, I'll show you what I like to do. I love the bass register of my piano, so I like to add octaves. As, as you may have heard in some of my other performances, I like to add octaves here to give it the full effect. So. here. Leave the pedal down. Crescendo. Decrescendo. And change the pedal. So there's no need to slow down a lot at the end if you come back to your original tempo. I think a lot of performers play, <coughs> they, they play the last two measures too quickly and as a result it, it kind of ruins the, the serenity and the calm of it. So be very careful with those last two measures. I, I know it might seem like a little thing but I think it's very important to give um, the whole nocturne uh, unity. So there we have it. We worked up, uh, you know, I don't make any uh, apologies for the length of this tutorial. This is arguably the most popular piece ever written for the piano. Um, one of the most beautiful pieces ever written for the piano and it provides the pianist and the student um, really unequal opportunities for using the piano's resources. Uh, you know, really it was unprecedented. It really was a groundbreaking piece uh, early. You know, it's only Opus 9. It was early in Chopin's career, so he was still young. You know, he really, really knew how to use the piano for all it's worth. And you, as a pianist and a student, um, really should do everything you can to do justice to this piece. And in order to do it justice, you need to work through the details, you need to pay your dues, do your right hand, do your left hand, put them together, no pedal. And then finally you can enjoy the fruits of your labor when you finally put pedal and, and make it a finished product. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, a tutorial and all the segments in this tutorial and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.